We'd like to thank our sponsors, No Watch, who are determined to help society connect back to the present moment. No Watch is a smart jewelry, a wearable that measures and predicts stress one hour in advance, helping you restore balance and improve relaxation and sleep with a collection of nine interchangeable gemstones to suit your daily mood and style. Through skin conductance, it knows what your cortisol levels are and where they're headed. With a subtle vibration, you are reminded to stay in the stress-free zone by taking a bath, going for a walk, doing yoga, or meditation. The No Watch campaign is live on Kickstarter, so head over there to purchase your No Watch today at nowatch.com. Supply is limited. Hi, my name is Yasmin Terehi, and this is Gateways to Awakening, where we host one-on-one conversations with leading experts in wellness, well-being, and spirituality. Today's episode is about what lucid dreaming means and how we can learn from it with Charlie Morley. Charlie is a best-selling author and teacher of lucid dreaming, shadow integration, and mindfulness of dream and sleep. And he's been lucid dreaming for over 20 years and was authorized to teach within the Kagyu School of Tibetan Buddhism by Lama Yeshe Rinpoche in 2008. He's written four books, which have been translated into 15 languages, and he's spoken at both Oxford and Cambridge, the Ministry of Defense, Mindfulness Symposium, the Houses of Parliament, to name a few. And in 2018, he was awarded a Winston Churchill Fellowship Grant to research PTSD treatment in veterans and continues to teach people with trauma-affected sleep a set of practices called Mindfulness of Dream and Sleep, which we will go into in the show. And I most recently took Charlie's quest on Mind Valley and just absolutely loved it and was so excited to have him on the show. So welcome to the show, Charlie. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. So Charlie, to kick it off, can you tell us what does it mean to lucid dream? Great question. Actually, that's quite a loaded question. Let's (laughs) first of all look at what what a lucid dream kind of means, the definition, and then literally what it means to do it. So a lucid dream is a dream where you're actively aware of the fact you're dreaming as the dream is happening. So if anyone's had one of those dreams where you're sound asleep, but in the dream you go, oh, wow, this is all a dream. And because I know it's a dream, I can start to direct it, choreograph it, maybe even control the dream at will. That's a lucid dream. But actually, I love your question there because it can be taken many ways. You know, what is it? What does it mean to lucid dream? What is the meaning behind lucid dreaming? Well, the real meaning of lucid dreaming is conscious access to the unconscious mind, the ability to consciously go where the conscious mind is usually not able to go um, unguided. You know, there are ways to access the unconscious mind through hypnosis, hypnotherapy, through deep meditation, through guided journeying, through psychedelics, all these brilliant modalities. For some people, they're brilliant. Others, not so not so brilliant. Lucid dreaming is one of the few that allows you to do it yourself. You are literally deep diving into your own psychology. You are walking or flying around a huge virtual reality simulation created out of your own psychology, um, which is quite a trip and uh, really fun and also very, very beneficial. Yeah. And it's so funny because speaking of lucid dreaming, I definitely had a lucid dream this morning and, you know, yeah, I was not able to quite uh, grasp it when I woke up. Um, But, you know, it was just, it was so fascinating how real it was. And it felt like I was in some kind of circle with a lot of different types of people um, in some kind of journey of some sort. But, um, You know, anyways, uh, we could talk about that later because I was going to ask you about it. But um, can you talk to us a little bit about like the stages of sleep and how sleep works? You know, what are the, how do you get to the lucid dreaming state within the, the journey of sleeping? Yeah, sure thing. So lucid dreaming happens almost exclusively in REM dreaming sleep, rapid eye movement dreaming sleep. So, um, by the time you get to REM, you've been through like three or four other stages of sleep. So when you're in a lucid dream, you are totally asleep. Like you've been asleep for, you know, most of the time when you first fall asleep, it takes kind of 90 minutes to get your first REM period. So you're absolutely asleep. But before you get to dreams, you go through the hypnagogic state, which is this like transitional state of mind, which is kind of, it's like the process of falling asleep. It it is, it is class as stage one of sleep, um, but it's kind of half awake, half asleep, the process of falling asleep. Then you have stage two of sleep, light sleep 
um, in which you are now blacked out, but you probably haven't started dreaming yet. Um, if you wake people from light sleep and ask what were they dreaming about, they usually say nothing, but they were kind of thinking about something. It's kind of concepts can arise, but not full dreams. Then the brain like almost entirely blacks out, goes to deep sleep, which is where growth hormones are released and um, uh, plaques are kind of flushed through the brain. It's really important for neurological health. And then the brain does something really weird. It goes from almost entirely switched off in deep sleep to entirely switched on in REM dreaming sleep. You know, the dreaming brain is incredibly active. It's so active that you burn calories when you dream. So somebody listening now in the waking state, your brain is less active now than it will be when you enter REM dreaming sleep. Incredibly active, non-restful. It's not about rest. It's about psychological integration, memory reconsolidation, and um, integration of trauma, actually, too. So it's in that stage that you dream. And if you dream, you can lucid dream. Um, and lucid dreaming is the art of training the mind to become self-reflectively aware within the REM dreaming sleep state. So it is real. We've got all the science to back this up. Lucid dreaming was first scientifically verified in 1975. Um, so this has been kind of a long path scientifically, or at least 40 years. Uh, but in the spiritual traditions, people have known about lucid dreaming for millennia. You find it in the Sufi tradition going back at least four or five hundred years, in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition going back at least a thousand years, Toltec Mexica tradition at least a thousand years. Um, there is nothing new about lucid dreaming. The scientific exploration of it is new, though. Um, and what they found is that once you gain conscious access to the unconscious mind and become lucid, you can actually change your brain while you sleep because the prefrontal cortex lights up when you have a lucid dream. And once that lights up, your brain actually thinks you're awake. So it starts to lay down neural pathways in the same way as if you were actually awake, which is how these um, ideas, are, well, not ideas, but these um, phenomena of lucid dream healing for psychological healing, PTSD, trauma work seem to work so powerfully. Because if you integrate a trauma in a lucid dream, your brain doesn't think you dreamt about integrating that trauma. As far as your brain's concerned, you really did integrate that trauma. And that's why lucid dreaming is such a powerful treatment for people working with nightmares and post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm. Yeah. And I want to actually double click on that point because you do a lot of work with um, veterans. You do, you do a lot of work with people who have PTSD. And I remember um, you talking about nightmares and how, you know, oftentimes I have always thought that whenever I had a nightmare, I just wanted like to wake up and just, you know, not have to experience it. Um, you know, and I remember you saying something like, no, you should actually embrace the nightmare or embrace the, whatever is happening that feels, um, kind of like a, a sense of terror, uh, because then you're able to integrate it. Um, but can you talk yeah. about that? Yeah. I really think that's such a powerful point. Um, because I think so many people are probably very confused about that. And we often, you know, try to not actually, you know, um, you know, continue the dream or continue experiencing things that make us feel scared or that make us, uh, feel any sense of fear. Yeah. So there's a lot of, uh, both misinformation and superstition around nightmares, <laughs> In um, the Western uh, tradition and Western cultures, it's usually a lot of disinformation about nightmares, people thinking that nightmares are a sign of, um, of a broken mind um, or that nightmares are a sign um, that there's something wrong with us, in which case we know scientifically from Western science this is not true. In many ways, the nightmares are indicating the mind is healing because nightmares are a sign of our inbuilt healing mechanism. In the same way as when we cut our arm, a scab will form. A scab is protecting the wound so the healing can occur beneath the surface. A nightmare is working exactly the same way. So a nightmare in many ways is an outer expression of a healing that is occurring beneath the surface in the unconscious mind. So there's nothing wrong with nightmares. In fact, if we didn't have nightmares, we'd go crazy. We'd go mad after the smallest traumas because nightmares are so important for helping us to integrate our traumas. And then in other cultures, non-Western cultures, there's often a lot of superstition about nightmares, that nightmares um, are a sign of, you know, demons coming into our dreams or bad spirits and stuff like that. And again, that leads people to really kind of push nightmares away and see themselves as um, somehow broken or cursed if they're having nightmares. And again, all of the all of the research that I've done, not only in the Western tradition, but in the shamanic and spiritual traditions too, says that, that that's actually not the case at all. 
because nightmares give us these powerful chances to see where our traumas lie, to see where our, our um, you know, to see that there's a quote from a Hindu teacher who says nightmares give you a chance to see the dirt in your water pipes. They show you what's really there. And once we can see the dirt in our water pipes, we can start to clean that out. You know, so it gives us this great uh, opportunity to do that. Now, how do we do that? The first thing is to know that nightmares are okay. And when we have a nightmare, it's like a dream that's shouting. It's the dreaming mind shouting to draw our attention to a wounded part of the psyche, just like pain. In the same way, the pain response in the body is like the body shouting to us saying, hey, you've hurt your elbow, you've cut your elbow, so I'm going to send you a shout of pain so that you know to, uh, you know, apply healing to the elbow, whatever that might be. It's a, Nightmares are doing the same. They're pointing, our, they're drawing our attention to a part of the mind that is unintegrated. So although they're horrible and we wake up feeling you know, really distressed by them naturally. Um, it's like a bit of medicine, you know, nightmares are doing a good job. Mm. Wow. Powerful. And can you uh, walk us through maybe an example of someone that you've worked with who has had maybe PTSD or a lot of trauma? Um, how would you, how would you kind of like diagnose or like work with them, um, to help them heal? Like, is it a specific trauma that you can work with or is it just whatever arises? Um, and then also, you know, can you share a story of how you were able to heal maybe something within your own, uh, psyche through, through dream healing? Yeah. So there was a guy, um, he's become a friend of mine now. Uh, I'll change his name for anonymity but he's featured in my new book, Wake Up to Sleep, which is out now, um, which is all about working with trauma and, and stress-affected sleep using lucid dreaming and other modalities. And um, this gentleman, let's call him Asim, he found a copy of my book in a uh, secondhand bookshop in Iraq. It was a copy of my lucid dreaming book translated into Arabic. And, oh no, sorry, his wife found it for him because he had had a traumatic experience that had led him to have lots of nightmares. And this was a very kind of, um, well, not an everyday experience, but a very kind of worldly uh, trauma had happened to him. He was an academic and uh, he was trying to enter a certain country in the West and um, his visa application, there was a problem with it. They thought he was trying to enter illegally. He wasn't. Uh, and he actually got put in prison for a couple of weeks, which doesn't sound like a long time, but it can be a very traumatic experience, especially if you're imprisoned unfairly, which he was. And when he got out of prison, even though his name was fully cleared, you know, something sticks and his academic reputation got affected and he wasn't invited back to certain conferences. It affected his job. He lost his position at the university. Really kind of traumatic experience for him. And he was having terrible nightmares and also panic attacks during the day. He got a skin complaint like eczema from the stress. You know, it was really affecting him. So his wife got him a copy of my book in this uh, bookshop in, in Iraq. And he started to learn the lucid dreaming practices. So he taught himself and you can, you know, with a book or an online course or, or, or a workshop, you can teach yourself to lucid dream. So he managed to train his himself to become lucid. And in one of these nightmares, he would have these dreams that he was um, kind of being accused and stuff like that. And in one of these dreams, he was back in the country where it had happened. And in the dream, he realized, hang on, how am I back in this country? I, I don't, I'm not there anymore. And that made him realize he was dreaming. He was like, wait, then I must be dreaming. Oh, wow, I'm dreaming. I'm lucid. So he knew he was fully lucid. And then he reflected on what he wanted to do. He thought, okay, well, now that I'm conscious in my unconscious mind, what can I do in my lucid dream to help heal me? So he called out to the dream in the same way as a hypnotherapist would guide you into the subconscious mind and then implant a suggestion of healing intent such as I live a healthy lifestyle free of the addiction of cigarettes, if you're working with nicotine addiction. He, in his own lucid dream, implanted his own affirmation statement of intent. He called out in the lucid dream, I am not the monster these people make me out to be. I am innocence. And when he emailed me this dream, he said, I didn't say I am innocent. I said, I am innocence. He wanted to implant the, the kind of quality of innocence in his mind. And when he did this, the dream responded. You know, this is the cool thing when you engage psychological healing in the lucid dream. It's like a biofeedback mechanism. And in this case, when he started calling out, I am innocence, I am innocence, all these red flowers started to grow in the dream, almost like a symbol of kind of of, of this innocence, of this of this flowering, of this glowing. And then all the children appeared and they were playing in a playground, you know, the symbol of, again, innocence or, or play. 
And then he was still lucid. And he thought, um, oh, I'm, I'm going to work with the other thing that's been affecting me. And what it was, um, his practice of prayer, you know, his five times a day prayer had been affected by this. He was a, a devout Muslim. And um, because of his kind of anxiety and the panic attacks, he had not been doing this regularly. He'd been missing some sessions. So he called out in the dream um, to ask forgiveness for God. And he had this powerful experience of feeling the energy of God in the dream. Uh, and he woke up, uh, you know, crying with this uh, big emotional response to the dream. And then he emailed me. And this was like three months after. He said three months after that dream, still, um, the panic attacks are gone. The nightmares are gone. He never had those nightmares again. And his skin complaint went uh, like within days of waking up from that dream. So he really saw like direct evidence of healing. And I'm not surprised because the skin complaint was caused by elevated cortisol levels, probably. So once he reduced his cortisol levels due to the lucid dream healing, the skin complaint went. And he said, my wife says I am like night and day, the difference in me. So a really powerful example of how an everyday guy, you know, an Islamic scholar, who had gone through a traumatic experience, very worldly traumatic experience, being falsely imprisoned and, you know, slandered, uh, could use lucid dreaming to heal him. Wow. Wow. That story is just so moving. And what a powerful, um, you know, evidence of just, you know, our mind and what we can do to yeah. actually solve, yeah, these these things, these kind of ailments in our waking hours. Um, during the the dreaming stage, the lucid dreaming stage. And I actually want to go through that exercise and we can come back to a story about you because I really also want to hear that. But I, I want to actually go through this exercise because I think people who are listening are probably very interested um, in at least like, you know, the, the process of what happens when you are lucid dreaming um, you know, what do you, you said that there's an affirmation. Um, can you talk t to us about maybe the couple steps that we should take if we have a lucid dream? And I know, by the way, that this is, you know, the tip of the iceberg because you have like a full program of, um, of education on, on actually healing in the, in the lucid dreaming state, but maybe we could just start at the top of that iceberg and, and talk about that at, at a high level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. Your, your question is nice, actually, because it's not about how to have a lucid dream. It's what to do once we become lucid. Um, so obviously the, the kind of process of how to do it. Yeah, there are books and courses and all that. But let's say you are already having lucid dreams or if you have a lucid dream tonight, which is, by the way, very likely like people listening to this podcast, especially if it's the first time you've heard about lucid dreaming, your chances of having a lucid dream just went through the roof because it's it's as if it's something you remember. You know, children naturally lucid dream. Um, we know this from a Harvard study. So everybody listening has had multiple lucid dreams. You probably just don't remember. So sometimes if you first hear about lucid dreaming in adulthood, there's something in the uh, in the psyche that kind of remembers and gives us a lucid dream. Um, so let's say you become lucid. I think the first thing to do is actually before you become lucid to work out what do you want to do. So what I would say is anything you can treat through hypnotherapy, you can also treat through lucid dreaming. So if you had a free appointment with a hypnotherapist tomorrow, what would you choose to do with that hypnotherapist? That's the kind of answer to what would I do in my lucid dream. So you might think, oh, I want to work with my uh, uh, misuse of alcohol, or I want to work with my confidence, or I want to work with um, trauma from my past relationship, or I want to work in uh, increasing my confidence in my own sexuality, whatever it is. Anything you would work with with a hypnotherapist, you can work with in your lucid dream. So first of all, make a choice. Now, in the same way as a hypnotherapist, maybe not a hypnotherapist, but a hypnotist, can use hypnosis just for fun. I mean, we've all seen this kind of stage show, maybe or in the UK anywhere, nightclubs sometimes, they bring on a hypnotist and you hypnotize the drunk people to think they're chickens and stuff like hmm. that. That's actually still genuine hypnosis, you know, if they're a real hypnotist anyway. Um, so in the same way, lucid dreaming can be used just for fun. So if you want to use your lucid dreams to fly about and date movie stars and have fun, then you go for it. But whatever it is, make your decision before you become lucid. So that if you get lucid tonight, you know, oh, wow, I'm dreaming, I'm dreaming. This is what I wanted to do. The next step is to engage what's called the Sankalpa. So Sankalpa is a term taken from the Sanskrit yogic tradition. And um, Sankalpa means will or intent. This is the kind of action that you're going to take once you become lucid. So in the example I gave with Asim, his Sankalpa was to call out in the dream, I am innocence. 
I am not the monster these people make me out to be. So he's directly acknowledging his trauma. I'm not the monster these people make me out to be. And then he is reinstalling an affirmative um, kind of action, which is I am innocence. So he's calling that out like an, like an affirmation, like a hypnotic suggestion. He's implanting that into his mind. So in that case, it would be calling something out in the dream. But let's say you wanted to use your lucid dream for uh, meditation. Very powerful way to do your spiritual practices in the lucid dreams in both the Mexican and the Tibetan traditions. This is recommended. In that case, you wouldn't kind of call out, no, I'm going to meditate. You'll just become lucid and then do your meditation in the lucid dream itself. Let's say you wanted to practice a skill. A lot of science, uh, about three or four different scientific studies have shown that when athletes learn to lucid dream, and when they practice their athletic discipline in the lucid dream state, they actually get better in the waking state. So I was part of one of these studies uh, using martial artists, and they found that 81.3% of the 25 people on the study who practiced martial arts in their lucid dream, 81.3% got better at martial arts in the waking state. So you can actually practice things in the lucid dream and get better at it. And in that case, what would it look like? It would look like becoming lucid and literally doing whatever your sport or activity is in the lucid dream, just as you would in the waking state, but obviously without the kind of constraints of uh, waking state limitations and gravity and stuff like that. But basically, you can do whatever you like in a lucid dream. You are you really are limited by your imagination only because you are literally inside your imagination. So you can do the impossible. You can be who you've always wanted to be. You can really use lucid dream to step into the full manifestation of your of your highest being. Wow, powerful. And Charlie, can you talk to us about an example that you've used in your own life? Like, can you walk us through those same steps that you describe, but perhaps something that you've done uh, could be recent or just could be maybe something that was most memorable? I imagine that you lucid dream like every night. So I bet you've got a ton of stories uh, to share with us. Yeah, I don't lucid dream every night. I wish I did. I lucid (laughs) dream whenever I kind of do the practice. And in fact, my lucid dreaming since lockdown has got, has drastically decreased because the vast majority of the lucid dreams I would have was when I was running retreats, which would be like once a month usually, um, where you've got like 50 people on a retreat and we sleep in, you sleep in your own bed for the first half of the night. Then the second half of the night you sleep in the sacred sleeping area. And I'm there kind of guiding people into the dream state. And because I'm really on duty and also because of the kind of group, um, energy, and also just my ego, isn't it? Because there are 50 people expecting me to have a lucid dream with the same expectation that you had. So I have to switch it on. <laughs> <laughs> then I might be getting lucid every night. But gosh, since lockdown, wow, no, I've really, I really felt it. I have to really be very active in making sure I do my practice. Otherwise, it can go weeks where I'm like, oh, God, I haven't done any lucid dreaming for ages. So no, I'm not doing it every night. Um, but I think that's why I'm good at teaching it, because I'm not, you know, some reincarnated Tibetan Lama who just came out of the womb and was able to lucid dream. <laughs> I, if I do the practices, if I go through the protocol, I have lucid dreams. If I'm too lazy to do so, I don't. Uh, so I really know what works and what doesn't. But anyway, um, let's do a recent one, the one that I probably haven't shared in any podcast before. Oh, my heels. Um, so <laughs> because of lockdown, I started running. Um, I do a lot of martial arts, but I don't really run, don't jog. But I started running, you know, small distances, maybe 5, 10K with a friend a couple of times a week. And I developed something called plantar fasciitis, which is um, a thing where it really hurts your heels. It's like real deep pain in your heels. It's actually due to a calf muscle from not from running incorrectly. But anyway, I developed that and I thought, oh, right. In my next lucid dream, I want to see if I can heal it um, through lucid dream healing. Now, there's no science on lucid dream healing yet. Lots of anecdotal reports, as in, sorry, physical healing I'm talking about, not psychological. Psychological healing, yeah, loads of science backing that up. Physical healing, nah, that's still too far out, although we know it's possible, and this is an example of it. So I became lucid, and I was, oh, I'm dreaming, I'm dreaming, right, what did I want to do? Oh, I wanted to heal my heels. And as I said that in my head, I was like, well, that's going to be my sankalpa. I hadn't thought of the sankalpa, I thought in the moment, that's going to be it. So in the lucid dream, I grab my dream heels, uh, my or my left foot. So obviously I'm asleep in bed, but in the dream, I grab my heel and I put both my hands over my heels and I start imagining that I'm sending healing energy into my heels. 
And of course, imagining doing something in a lucid dream leads to manifestation because you are in the imaginary realm. So you imagine something and it happens. So as I do this, all this white light started coming out of my hands and surrounding the point of inflammation on my heels. And I was like, whoa, this is so cool. You know, I've done it so many times, but it still shocks me how visceral it is and how like in a movie you would expect it, how it would look if someone was healing themselves it looks like that you know white light coming out the palms of your hands and then i start saying over and over in my mind my heels are healed my heels are healed my heels are healed and this energy starts building up building up building up building up building up and it feels like this really intense healing and then of course the next day you wake up and as soon as i get out of bed no my heel hurt and i thought oh it hasn't worked and although there was an initial pain as i put my heel down I then kind of moved again and there was just no pain reaction. And I was like, whoa, that's weird. Where's the pain gone? And I had a solid like two, three weeks of I was still running, same amount, doing the same things, not doing any special stretching. And there were just no plantar fasciitis symptoms from that. Now, about three, four weeks later, the symptoms did come back. And I think that's really important to say lucid dreaming healing isn't some sort of uh, silver bullet. I think what it does is probably maximize your immune response or maximize the kind of anti, uh, uh, anti-inflammation anti response or something like that, um, you know, releasing anti-inflammatories. So it can work for short periods, uh, but then the pain will come back. And I think that's a re- kind of a realistic one to share. It's still miraculous that you can do something in your dream that will reduce pain in something that's been pretty chronic for like four weeks. I mean, that's still amazing. But yeah, four weeks later, it did come back and I did some stretches and had some physio and stuff. Um, Now, of course, what you could do is once a month, do the same lucid dream healing. Um, Look at it like an alternative medicine. You know, do I think that acupuncture can be used to treat cancer? No, I think you should probably use Western medicine to treat cancer, but then use acupuncture as a brilliant alternative um, practice alongside Western allopathic medicine. I think probably the same with lucid dreaming. You know, if I got cancer, I would use the best that the West can offer, but I would also use these powerful alternative practices such as lucid dream healing. Wow. That's such a fascinating story. (laughs) I love that. So I'm going to do that on my knee and I'm sure a lot of people have different ailments over the years from injuries. What's up with your knee? What's up with my knee? Yeah. Um, just had multiple surgeries, uh, ACL, meniscus, all oh. that. <laughs> okay, cool. So I had an ACL. Um, well, I actually don't know what it was because the lucid dream healing was so powerful. I never had physio on it. So I know that you can work with knee injuries. I had a really bad one from a MMA um, a sparring session. And I was like, whoa, my knee is out. My knee was so bad that I woke up in the night and was sick. I was actually vomited from the pain. When I went back to sleep after being sick in the bathroom, I became lucid. And in that lucid dream, I did a really strong lucid dream healing on the knee. And the next day, yes, there was still inflammation, but massively reduced, massively reduced. So for knee injuries, I really know that can work powerfully. Wow. So fascinating. And I, so I want to talk about uh, how to actually get into a lucid state. I know we kind of skipped over that, but as, as you know, this conversation has evolved, I sort of want to go back to it because I think that a lot of people probably aren't aware of how they actually can get into a lucid dreaming state. And then, you know, my, my difficulty is I always know when I'm lucid dreaming, but there's like some part of me that can't actually like consciously, there's a part of the, there's a, it's hard to describe, but there's a part of me that can't actually, um, you know, say like, I know I'm lucid dreaming and here's what I want to do. Here's what I want to heal. Like I sort of just am watching and observing the lucid dream and it doesn't feel that witnessing state. Yeah. Yeah. So that's great. If you're getting to witnessing state, that's brilliant. But yeah, to be fully lucid, like if, to have a fully lucid dream, it's you'll literally be in the dream going, wow, this is a dream. I'm going to email Charlie about this in the morning. Uh, you can even think like, what time is it? Oh, it's probably about four o'clock. So I woke up to pee at three o'clock an hour ago. You like, you know, full, full access to waking state memory and totally 100% sure that you're dreaming. So when you get to that stage, you will totally know it. But for now, that's brilliant. If you're in that witnessing state where you're kind of like, oh, wow, this is a dream. But I don't know it's a dream so much that I can actually interact and choose what to do. It's still brilliant you're at that stage. 
Oh, cool. And so is there anything I can do uh, before I go to bed or, you know, at that stage, like what would you suggest? And what's the, what's the protocol? If it, uh, if it's something that we can share on this podcast, I imagine that there's a lot of steps to this, but you know, just curious. Yeah, but there's a few we can do now. Okay. So one of them we've actually already done, I call this the four D's. So they all begin with D. So the first one we've done, which is dream planning, which is like decide what you want to do in your first or next lucid dream. So that one we've covered already. Um, the second D is dream recall. So training yourself to remember your dreams. So anyone listening thinking, oh, I don't dream, you do dream unless you've had a heavy head injury or a stroke. Uh, and even then, it's very rare to lead to full lack of dreaming. Um, it is possible, but incredibly rare. Um, so everybody dreams every night. Why? Because it's linked to our survival. There's actually no way to stop the human brain from dreaming. Uh, you might stop entering other stages of sleep, but dreaming sleep, you're really going to be having that every single night because it's so important for memory reconsolidation and trauma integration. So you're definitely dreaming, but you maybe don't remember your dreams. So how to start remembering your dreams. As you fall asleep, set a really strong intention to remember your dreams, especially if you can, as you pass through that hypnagogic state, which is that falling asleep state. It's a really suggestible state there. You're kind of basically in a state, not, not basically, you are in a state of natural hypnosis when you fall asleep. So if you fall asleep, implanting like a self-hypnotic suggestion, something like, tonight I remember my dreams, I have excellent dream recall. You fall asleep saying that over and over again for a few minutes as you fall asleep, that's probably enough for most people to shift themselves into memory of their dream. But for many people, just knowing, just hearing me say you are definitely dreaming is enough. Because I think if we think we're not dreaming, there's no part of us that even bothers trying to remember. But once we know, wow, so I am definitely dreaming every night. Okay, so now I'm going to try and remember. So that's the second D. The third D is dream diaries. So writing down your dreams in some way. This could be, it doesn't have to be literally in a diary. It could be on your phone. You could draw it. You could speak it out loud. But in some way, taking note of your dreams. So kind of recounting your dreams, taking that unconscious process and making it conscious by writing it down or by putting it into your phone. You don't need to write everything, just kind of five minutes in the morning. The general outline of the dreams will be enough. Then that leads us to the next D. The final one, the reason you write your dreams in your dream diary is to spot patterns. And these patterns will start to emerge in what's called dream signs. So a dream sign is basically anything in your dream that can signal to you or be a sign to you that you are dreaming. So if you have dreams that you're just in the office at work, then there's probably no dream signs. But if you're dreaming about celebrities or kids from school or dead relatives or being in places where you no longer live or where you've never lived, um, those could all be classed as dream signs. So aspects of the dream that can indicate to you, hey, man, you're dreaming. Once you start writing down your dreams, you'll start to be aware of those dream signs. You'll, you'll see patterns emerging. You're like at the end of the week, you'll be, oh, wow, look, I always dream of that childhood home. Or I often dream of that celebrity or I often dream of that kid at school or I haven't seen for 30 years or whatever it might be. And then once you start noticing those patterns, you're you're very close to lucidity now because you've started to make an association with the dream signs and the fact that you are dreaming. So the next time you dream about that celebrity or the next time you dream about your child at home, something becomes triggered in the mind and we go, oh, wait, I always dream about being at this place. Oh, wow, I'm dreaming right now. And that's actually the most common form of lucid dream. It's called dream sign initiated lucid dream. So when I shared Asim's dream earlier, where he was dreaming away, and then he was like, hang on, how am I back in this country where I don't live anymore? Oh, I must be dreaming. So classic example of how he saw a dream sign, and then that triggered him into lucidity. So those are the four Ds, dream planning, then dream recall then dream diaries, and then finally dream signs. So those are the kind of like four beginner steps. Um, and actually with those, people could start to get lucid tonight. And obviously there's loads more techniques they can learn too. Yeah, it's so interesting about uh, keeping a dream journal. I actually did that for about, I think six months um, when I was going through like a little bit of a transition in 2019. And it's so funny because I a year later looked back um, and I had written this, this dream, this is so funny. You'd actually know the person I'm now talking about, but I had written, um, I had a dream last night in which I interviewed Marissa Peer. And at the time I was oh. like, wait, what? Like, you know, it didn't make any sense to me at the time. And then he, like about a year later, 
um, you know, I didn't even have a podcast at the time that I'd written that dream down. Um, a year later, I had actually had a podcast and then had interviewed Marissa Peer, and it was just kind wow. of <laughs> mind blowing manifestation. Yeah, you did it. That's yeah. Cool. yeah, yeah. So I probably just need to get back to uh, keeping a dream journal because, um, yeah, it was very powerful. It was a lot of you know symbolic references that a lot of times I couldn't really make sense of, but. It was just interesting. Um, you yeah, know. There, there's so much happening in dreams. Like e- every human being, I think, should write down their dreams. Like if you want to, like we go to therapists, right? And we say, you know, hey, what's happening in my mind? If you want to know what's happening in your mind, look at your dreams. They give you a direct insight. A dream is representative of the internal environment of your mind. What are your dreams like? Are you always being chased? Are you always fighting off attackers? What does that say about the state of your mind? There's some internal conflict there. Neither good nor bad, nothing to be ashamed of, but it just shows at this moment there's a lot of internal conflict. Or are all your dreams, you know, sunbathing on a beach? Then, okay, what is that to you? Maybe that's inner peace or maybe that's a very calm state of mind. In a very obvious way, without needing to interpret the dream, it just gives you a kind of a check, like a kind of a, um, like an engine check. You know, how's my engine going? Look at your dreams. And it's not necessarily that if you're having, you know, nice dreams, your mind is great. And if you're having nightmares, that means you're a disaster. It can be quite the opposite. In fact, sometimes people, um, in, there are even certain Buddhist practices that you do where you want to be having nightmares. Nightmares are a sign of spiritual uh, kind of success. They're a sign that you're purifying certain parts of the mind, that you're working through trauma. Um, so it's not that kind of, you know, beach dreams versus nightmares, one's better than the other. It's just keeping a dream diary, you get to see that. You miss so much if you don't write down your dreams. And the dreamer spends so much time, you know, two and a half hours every night. Your mind is taking a lot of time and energy to create these amazing Hollywood productions. And yet there's no one there to witness them. So no wonder people's dreams are boring. You know, people say, I don't write down my dreams because they're so boring. And I'm like, your dreams are so boring because you don't write them down. If you start writing down your dreams, studies have shown that within about a week, are people starting to write down their dreams? The vividness increases. Um, the um, oh, sorry, the vividness increases, and also the subjective meaningfulness of the dream seems to rise. So basically, we start to take more meaning from our dreams only once we start writing them down. Mm, I love that so much, and I, you know, it's so interesting. I think that we're also so kind of defaulted in terms of communication with words in culture that this like lost art of communication through symbols, which feels like so, right. It's, it's something that we're just, we don't practice because we're, we just rely exclusively on, on words and maybe body language, but the, the metaphorical world for me as like a writer and storyteller is actually very powerful in terms of, you know, creating a, a narrative. And so I think that this lost art of communication through, through symbols is actually like, like dreaming is like the best way for us to continue um, learning and educating ourselves in this lost art. So I I love that. And I think that's probably why it scares so many people to make sense of their dreams. Like, you know, there's a lot of desire to to numb out. um, Yeah. Right. Like through drugs, alcohol, whatever addiction. Um, And so I think that facing our dreams is also having to face maybe some of our shadow side and the monsters that are, that are, are in everyone, right. In, in all of us. And so, um, yeah, I think it, it takes a, a level of courage to be able to say, I want to know myself and know what's in my mind, good and bad, all of it. I totally agree. Yeah. The spiritual path, the path of awakening is, is not for the faint hearted. You know, this is not a comfortable path. Uh, that old saying, ignorance is bliss as far as the internal world goes. There's some truth to that, not in the long run, but in the short run, it can seem like there is a, a bliss in not knowing. Once you start to look, once you start to see, you're going to see the whole of yourself. But of course, in the long run, it's brilliant to see the whole of yourself because you see who you really are. You see what you're really working with. And as you said, as a storyteller yourself, you know, you'll, you'll gain such benefit from your dreams. Oh, and in fact, there's an interesting study. They found that people who uh, ingest more complex narratives, so basically people who go to the theater a lot, people who read a lot of novels, people who watch a lot of kind of uh, deep cinema, they actually have deeper dreams. Like the dreamer learns um, certain kind of 
uh, like how to use a red herring, for example. The dream learns about subtext. The dream learns about subplots. So, for example, if before you go to bed, you've watched like a really complex art house movie, you are way more likely to have very complex symbolic dreams than if before bed you had watched, uh, you know, a soap opera or something like that. So they've shown there's a direct link to that. So for you as a storyteller, your dreams must be brilliant. I'd love to see your dream diary. <laughs> yeah, I was when you said that, when people say that their dreams are boring, I was like, wow, I don't think a single dream of mine has ever been boring. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you know. I, I'm totally with you. But people do say that. They say, oh, my dreams are so boring. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, but I, I, I promise you, if you start writing them down, they'll, you'll start to get some fireworks. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, and I also, you know, do dabble in some film writing and, and film production. And oh, brilliant. Yeah. So I have a lot of really interesting um, stories that come to me in, in the dreaming state. And I mean, it's also, you know, when you're in this meditative state, that's usually when all these ideas kind of come. And I think a lot of people miss out on that when they don't actually calm the mind down or at least get into that space where you're accessing this like primordial knowledge um you know i guess like the collective mind is what people sometimes call it so yeah yeah so um, this is so fascinating charlie i mean i could feel like there's just so many more questions i have and i'm sure that a lot of people listening have so many questions about this thing that we do you know for for so much of our life that we we can't really understand um and i think for a lot of people uh dreaming, they don't treat dreaming, um, or even sleeping as therapy. And I think what I've realized after doing this work, um, with you on the Mind Valley app, um, and others is that there's actually like an incredible amount of therapy that you can, you can achieve right in this, like in this space. Um, so it's such an important yeah, part you of have an internal therapist in your mind, <laughs> like yeah. every 90 minutes, your internal therapist comes out and starts to sort out what's going on in your mind. It's like, it's there. And it's going to happen with or without you witnessing it. But a bit like a therapy session, you know, if, if you just sit there and say nothing, if you give nothing back to the therapist, it's going to be a long journey. But think what the therapist loves is when you start working with a client who's really up for it, you know, who's really giving something back, who's really present in the therapy session, then the therapeutic dyad is going to work at such a deeper level. And you're going to get such greater benefits from the therapy session. It's exactly the same with dreams to start to pay them attention even better to get lucid and then actually start to co-create them, the therapeutic benefits of the dream become maximized tenfold. Wow. Charlie, what about uh, people who suffer from insomnia, uh, people who might be taking prescriptions to sleep? Um, do you know anything about that or or do you, have you not studied um, folks who who maybe have massive insomnia? Because I think that that's just been such a big problem. Um, I can say anecdotally, I've noticed that a lot of people uh, these days have trouble sleeping or if they're if they do sleep, they, they don't sleep through the night, um, or they use some sort of supplement to, to go to bed. Yeah. So my new book is actually all about this. My new book's called wake up to sleep. And it's the first book I've written that is not primarily about lucid dreaming. It has got, uh, two chapters on lucid dreaming, but it's also got 12 chapters, not about lucid dreaming for people who let alone get to lucid dream. They just want to get to sleep. Um, so yeah, I have this, this new book all about that and about deep relaxation before bed, I think that's a really important thing. We have these states of wakefulness and then sleep. And we try to go straight from wakefulness to sleep, forgetting that there's a bridge between the two, which is rest. So really learning how to rest deeply through practices, not only of deep relaxation, but things like yoga nidra, hypnagogic mindfulness is really important. Also breath work. Um, for many people, the inability to get to sleep is due to a chronic overactivation of the nervous system. So if you're constantly in fight or flight in sympathetic dominance of the nervous system, you can do all the sleep hygiene tips you like, but you ain't getting to sleep because sleep requires the activation of the parasympathetic system, the rest and digest. There's simply no way to fall asleep without it. So if we can access the parasympathetic before bed or at any time during the day for extended periods through breath work, essentially, um, sorry, especially slow, deep breathing. So this is like the opposite to Wim Hof breath work. I'm talking about like five breaths a minute, four breaths a minute, very, very, very slow breaths. If you slow the breath down like that, that has a powerful impact on what's called parasympathetic drive, which is like the charge to sleep at night. 
Um, so it's really, really good for that. Also, just being aware of sleep, learning how sleep works. It's a really powerful way to kind of normalize your sleep cycles. Um, and yeah, there's a whole range of practices in that book. I think there's like um, 20, 19 or 20 different practices, um, especially for people with insomnia or stress affected sleep. So yeah, check that one out. What about how to transition from sleeping into waking? Like, What do you do in your own morning ritual? Like, Do you have like a like any kind of um, transition out of your lucid dream state? Just straight to the dream diary. Like literally the first thing I do in the morning is reach for my phone, but not to check emails, not to go on Facebook <laughs> or something, but to write down my dreams. So like every morning that's happening. And if I can't remember a dream for whatever reason, I'll write that. I know I've been dreaming, but I can't remember what. I might just write how I feel upon awakening. A bit like... um Oh, I've forgotten the wonderful author uh, who wrote The Artist's Way. Um, Julia Cameron? That's it, yeah. You know, she has morning pages Yes. where you write for a certain amount of time or a certain amount of pages in the morning. Think of your dream diary as your morning pages. It's about just expressing yourself first thing in the morning. So that's what I do. Before that state, actually, there's something called the hypnopompic state where if I don't have to wake up, if I'm not waking up with an alarm, you'll notice, and everyone will notice this, there's a state where you've stopped sleeping and dreaming your eyes are still closed, but you wouldn't say you're awake yet. That's called the hypnopompic state. And if you can rest there and meditate, it's a very, very powerful place for meditation. And not only is it a powerful place for meditation, it means that literally the first thing you've done upon awakening is meditate. And that sets you up for the entire day differently. You know, just like meditating before bed can affect your whole nighttime experience, meditating first thing in the morning. And I don't mean waking up, getting out of bed, having a glass of water and then meditating. I mean, literally transitioning from sleep to meditation with no gap. That really sets you up for the day because it's like the first experience of wakefulness you've had is a meditative one. So that's really powerful too. That's called hypnopompic meditation. And my, um, my other Buddhist teacher, Rob Nairn, who's a, uh, who's a Jungian psychologist turned Buddhist teacher. He's a real master of that. He really, he really uh, pushed that when we used to run workshops together. And he's, as his student, I really uh, advise people to do that to hypnopompic meditation. Wow. That's very powerful. Um, I'm going to try that because I normally meditate in the morning, but I don't go straight into meditation. And I agree that there's so, sort of some sort of break, you know, in the, yeah. you know, the, the transition. Yeah. It's about the continuity. Mm. Yeah. And also you're still lying down. So it's incredibly restful. It's like you're, you know, you, you're not asleep anymore. You're, you're, you're just lying there with your eyes closed. But, um, you know, for anyone who's, oh, I don't like to meditate in the morning. I feel too tired. It's like, we'll do hypnopompic meditation and then you can be as tired as you like because you're still lying down. <laughs> wow. Very, very cool. So, uh, Charlie, I have so many questions, but I, I, I know that we're coming to time. Uh, but do, do you think we have time to talk about, I might be butchering the name, but it's called the Colombo method? Yeah. So Colombo method is um, based on, well, as it sounds like the, the 1970s TV detective, Lieutenant Colombo, who was, um, I mean, I'm showing my age here, but they used to play reruns when I was a kid. And Colombo was like, he didn't even have a gun you know, very different to these new modern day TV detectives. Columbo would like walk into a room and he would use his mindful awareness to kind of scan for clues. And that's how he would solve the crimes and find out who the murderer was and all this kind of stuff. And when I started teaching lucid dreaming, I found that one of the best methods for people to do was actually to look really deeply in the waking state, because it soon became clear to me that people dream as they live. So if you live in a kind of real tunnel visioned awareness where you're not fully looking at the outside world, you're not fully connecting with people, you're kind of, you know, an iPhone zombie, then you are going to dream in the same way as we go about our daily life to really look closely at stuff, to look at the evidence of stuff, to look at life with a really broad mind, a kind of a childlike mind, um, not childish mind. That's different. Again, Columbo, he wasn't childish. He was childlike. He would always pretend that he didn't quite know what was going on, but actually had a deep intelligence. So if you start living your life like that in the daytime, you start to dream like that. And if you dream like that, it means you start to see things more. You start to be more aware of texture, both metaphorical and literal. You start to um, dream with your eyes more wide open. 
you know, and it really changes the quality of your dreams and also the quality of your life. It leads to kind of lucid living experiences as well. Um, and it means that when you're in a dream, if you're thinking like, wait, I think I might be dreaming or not, then you can also be like Columbo and look at the evidence. So Columbo would ask people, you know, where were you on the night of the crime or whatever? So look at your evidence and you think, okay, in this dream, I'm in Egypt uh, looking at the Great Pyramid. What's the last thing I can remember? You know, what's my alibi? Well, the last thing I can remember is brushing my teeth in my flat in London Bridge in the UK. And now I'm in Egypt. The alibi doesn't add up. Aha, I must be dreaming. So we can use the Columbo method, being like a detective of our mind, not only to see more in our waking state, but also to help us have lucid dreams. Yeah, I, I love that. It's like your own, you you have to be your own investigative uh, detective. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah. When I was writing the book, they wanted to call that the Sherlock Holmes method. And I said, no, very different. <laughs> Sherlock Holmes always let you know that he knows he was, he, he knew what was up, right? He was very proud of himself. Columbo's different. Columbo's got a kind of a childlike air. So it's much softer. There's a sense of humor to it. So it's, yeah, it's about being, if you're going to be a detective, be Columbo detective, not Sherlock Holmes detective in this case. And <laughs> I vaguely remember Columbo actually. So, um, yeah, I remember. It was it the '80s when that came out? Dude, I think it's earlier. I think it's like '70s, <laughs> like '60s or '70s. It all blurs into one, doesn't it? When you get over thirty, or that's what I found. <laughs> yeah, it must have been the reruns, but yeah, I vaguely remember that. <laughs> um, so, Charlie, what has surprised you the most on this journey? Wow, that's a big question. What has surprised me most on this journey? Um, what has surprised me most? I think the kind of people who can do it, the kind of people who can lucid dream. So, for example, a couple of months ago, we ran a scientific study into lucid dreaming with the Institute of Noetic Sciences, which are based in the Bay Area in uh, the U.S. And we had a group of um, fifth, no more, I think 50 or 60 people in the group, all of which had high PTSD scores. So they were all kind of clinically diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. And in this study, we had one week to see if we could get these people from no lucid dreaming at all to a state of lucidity, to have at least one lucid dream. And then in that lucid dream, they would see if they could heal an aspect of their PTSD. And I remember thinking, okay, a group of 50, if we got one week, we'll probably have a couple of lucid dreams. Um, maybe if we had a group who weren't working with PTSD, that would be much higher. But wow, these people have all got PTSD. They've got so much going on. It's going to be, you know, their stress levels must be through the roof. Who knows if they can lucid dream? What we found was in one week, 74% of those 50 or 60 participants, they all had lucid dreams. And what I found was that if your intention is strong enough to have a lucid dream, and if that intention is for healing, which it was in this particular case, the causes and conditions, the kind of um, outside aspects that you think might stop people from lucid dreaming, they all become negated. So please, anyone listening to this, you think, oh, I don't even sleep, let alone have a lucid dream or God, I'm deep in PTSD trauma. How could I ever have a lucid dream? That's not true. The thing that surprised me most is that if you set the intention to do something that will heal your mind, the mind is so desperate for healing that it will create the causes and conditions for that to occur. So that's what I found most surprising. Mm. is that actually anyone can do this if they have the right intention to do so. Yeah, that's the intention piece is so um, important. And I, I have actually tried that myself, just setting the intention before bed. Actually, it's like a command to the mind, right? It uh, it commands the mind to to look for it. And I think that's true in, in life, right? Like we, whatever we are looking for, we usually find. <laughs> in some respect. I love that you did that with the Institute of Noetic Sciences. We actually had, uh, I believe, the director of research, um, that's her title, on the show to talk about some of the studies that they've done. But Oh, like, brilliant. Yeah, it's a great, great organization. Uh, so, Charlie, what do you want to tell our listeners as your main takeaway? What's sort of your call to action for people listening? What is my call to action? Well, I guess it's got to be learn to lucid dream. Doesn't have to be with me, but learn from someone, from some medium, from some tradition. Learn to lucid dream. It's such a powerful technique for healing and integration and knowing yourself. And it's fun. It's like the most fun you can have in your pajamas almost. 
depending on <laughs> depending on who you are. <laughs> it makes going to bed fun. It's brilliant. It's good for you. There are no contraindications. Um, it's really, I think it is the next step in evolution. I really think it is. In fact, in um, Matthew Walker's seminal book, Why We Sleep, which, uh, wow, it's probably about eight or nine years old now, maybe. But in that book, he says, he theorizes that actually lucid dreamers might literally be a sign of, of evolution and that in the future, many more people will be lucid dreaming because it's actually a very natural state to be in. And if you look at the new generation coming up, the generation, if I'm an elderly millennial, then I guess this is the generation Z or generation Z. For them, lucid dreaming is normal. You know, these guys on TikTok and stuff, everyone knows about lucid dreaming. And so many of them are doing it because they've grown up in a culture where it's not weird. It's not only for special people. It's not something that takes a crazy amount of effort. So, of course, naturally, they're finding it easier. So I think that as we progress, this will be something that evolves with us and the next generation find that they can become lucid in all states of, of waking and sleeping, I hope. Love that. I love that. Amazing. Yes. Yeah, so everyone can do this. And, and where can people find you, Charlie? And can you share some of the books and websites that you have so people can find your information, your programs and how to, how to contact you? Sure. So charliemorley.com is my primary website, but also you'll find me on Instagram and Facebook. Apparently, if you just put, if you just put Charlie Lucid, into Google, all my stuff comes up. I think I'm the only Charlie associated with lucid dreaming. So you'll find my stuff. I'm very easy to find. And there's all stuff on YouTube and everything like that. Um, and the books, again, anywhere that sells books, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, eBay, whatever, you'll find my books. Um, the first two are on lucid dreaming, dreams of awakening, which is more of a spiritual one. And then lucid dreaming made easy, which is as it sounds. Now, my third book, Dreaming Through Darkness, is for anyone in, interested in the Jungian concept of shadow integration, as well as dream work. And then this uh, final book of mine, which had just come out, is called Wake Up to Sleep, Five Powerful Practices to Transform Trauma and Stress-Affected Sleep. So that's for anyone who's struggling to get to sleep. Wow. So many books. Amazing. Well, I'm going to go and read it. And then there are all the online courses and stuff like that, like the Mind Valley one that you so kindly mentioned. Yes. Yeah. I highly, highly recommend the Mind Valley course um, uh, with Charlie's Lucid Dreaming program. It's just incredibly detailed and there's a lot of practices that you can do. So, wow. Well, Charlie, thank you so much for your time. I learned so much in this conversation and I'm going to check out more of your books and you know, do more of a deep dive with, with some of these concepts, but this is just so powerful. And I'm just so grateful that you're doing this work and helping people heal in a very natural way, um, a way that we've pretty much all have forgotten. So um, thank you so much, Charlie. Thank you, Yasmin. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. And for our audience, thanks for joining and for listening. In this episode, we learned about lucid dreaming with Charlie Morley, and you can tune in to Gateways to Awakening, where we host one-on-one -on -one conversations with leading experts in wellness, well-being, spirituality. Thanks again.